I think he's the most dominant player in our game, uh, especially when he gets the ball in the post. He demands double. For the win! Yes! It's all over! Awesome. There, there's nothing he can't do on the court. He can average damn near triple double if he wanted to. That's the kind of player he is, so. He has negative attitude. I'm gonna make sure I put a bullet in your fucking head. DeMarcus was not always the boogie that we know and love, or hate. He was born to a single mom with four other kids in Birmingham, Alabama. His life was hard, he said on all the smoke that he witnessed his mother being subject to domestic abuse as a kid and growing up impoverished, it's not a road that leads to the light at the end of the tunnel, most of the time. He was different, he found his first love in sports, but not in basketball, his plan was actually to make it out playing football. The NFL dreams were crushed during his middle school career for no other reason that he kinda sucked. Tall and coordinated skinny dudes are not meant for the field, so to the court he went. It wasn't long before he jumped from a nobody playing AAU ball in Birmingham, Alabama, to a top big in the nation at the high school level. His game evolved quickly, but what proved to be problematic was his emotional stability, or lack thereof. He was kicked off the Birmingham team after an altercation with a faculty member on the bus, which turned physical. Boogie claims that he put his hands on him first, but I wasn't there and I couldn't tell you what happened. All I know from the incident is that this led his family to moving to Mobile, Alabama, and playing at LaFleur High School. They were a proven school, but they had room for him as he was the best player in the country at this time. He filled out physically into a dominating big, and he was tough as nails. It took a full team effort to slow him down. He was beaten in the paint, resulting in a loss of his front teeth in four separate occasions in high school. It was hard, I'm sure, but pressure makes diamonds, and DeMarcus finished his senior year ranked third in the nation according to 24-7 Sports, after averaging 24, 13, and 4.6, with 3.2 blocks and 5.1 steals. Yeah, talk about a loaded stat sheet. He closed the door as an All-American with an invite to join pretty much whatever college club he wanted to. This got a little sticky. He committed to Alabama Birmingham verbally before decommitting two weeks later and committing to Memphis University before Memphis coach John Calipari fled to Kentucky and so did DeMarcus. Finding his new home with the Wildcats paired DeMarcus with his partner in crime and John Wall. This was one of the smoothest duos in a while. DeMarcus put up some good numbers, which are way more interesting when taking into account that he only played 23 minutes a game. He was possibly the best interior scorer in the entire country. He had a killer combination of size and touch around the basket, making him the perfect interior bully. But he also moved surprisingly well for a 6 foot 11, 270 pound beast. You could say pretty confidently that this was the best duo in the country. I mean, John Wall was pretty much a lock for number one in the draft ever since he dropped the coldest high school mix in history, and Boogie was his pick and roll partner who ate up the glass better than anyone. The two fed off each other extraordinarily well. Along with Patrick Patterson and Eric Bledsoe, Wall and Eric could defend anyone and push and transition while Boogie was a great rim runner in his own right. While being the perfect horse in the paint, he was actually extremely skilled. He had a bag, no doubt about it. Assistant coach Rod Strickland gave him the nickname Boogie. After watching how he could dance on the low block, he was a dominant player personified. I mean, his per 40 minute numbers show how dominant of a scorer and rebounder that he was in college. I mean, 26 and 17 is pretty stupid. But they weren't benching to Marcus because they were blowing out teams. He just couldn't stay out of foul trouble at 5.5 fouls per 40 minutes. His interior defense was kind of brutal when matching up with other elite bigs. The Wildcats ran through the NCAA with their top duo in the country before being knocked out kind of early in the Elite Eight. This team was full of one and duns and DeMarcus was one of them. Going into the draft, he was projected throughout the early to mid lottery. There were scares of his defense, but more so than that, this was again with handling his personality. Calipari struggled with his attitude before getting him under control, so this guy was not exactly the best project for most coaches to take on. The Kings snatched him up 5th overall, and he was basically everything that they expected him to be. He put up 14 and 8 averages as a rookie, which are very solid, but there were problems with his game going both ways. Firstly being again a poor defender and a big foul hog. He led the league in fouls despite playing under 30 minutes a game, I mean, he could just kind of be exploited down there. Another noticeable problem with his game was his inefficiency scoring the ball. His shot selection wasn't great, he had a tendency to play more of a perimeter oriented game, that proved to not be very effective, and it hurt his field goal percentage quite a bit. Boogie was actually a pretty good perimeter player. His face-up game and jump shooting ability were developed, and they continued to get better and better, so I guess you could chop this up to a development period. 
What was not so great was again in his emotional outbursts. Top 10 in technical fouls. He was bad when it came to this. He lashed out at coaches, opposing players, teammates, and certainly referees. And this ruined his reputation quite a bit. I think when you're known as a little bit of a savage, they're going to treat you like a savage, and when things go wrong, you're not getting the benefit of the doubt ever. His rookie year was good in some aspects and bad in others, but the potential was there and they were going to build around this guy. But that's where this thing kind of fell apart. The Kings weren't exactly doing their part of the deal. Tyreek Hill and Demarcus were the future point of this team, and Tyreek was coming off a 20 point per game rookie year, then fell off the map completely following injuries and misutilization as well as whatever the hell happened to this guy. But the following year started a trend of missed opportunities and mismanagement. They finished piss poor in the Western Conference in Boogie's rookie year. And after a trade landed the 10th overall pick in the draft, the talent on the board still left was very solid up front, but more importantly on the wings. With Tobias Harris, Klay Thompson, and Kawhi still on the board, and the Kings drafted... Jimmer. Ah, alright, we all, we all know how this one turned out. I can cut them a little slack here for a couple reasons, they needed guard help badly, and they actually did get a future star guard here with the last pick in the draft. Isaiah Thomas proved to be impactful pretty quick for the Kings, so they found a little bit of life here before they did what the Kings do. The next two years can be chopped up to three things I'd say, slight improvements year after year in defensive awareness and shot selection, weird rosters with mixes of declining and improving talent, as well as unfortunate amounts of drama, most notably with coach Paul Westfall. Westfall handed Boogie a two-game suspension New Year's Day in his second season, stating it's for not aligning his goals with the team. Boogie requested a trade in which he later denied doing, and Westfall was fired four days later. Boogie caught a lot of flack for this situation, being called a coach killer or whatever garbage you want to say. But Westfall wasn't some golden boy either. It was a no-brainer to keep your franchise player happy. Regardless, when you ruin your reputation, you don't catch many breaks. And as one of the most polarizing players in the league, he continued to polarize with numerous suspensions and leading the league getting teed up like every week in 2013. As new opportunities presented the Kings, they also continued to shit the bed. In each of these drafts, drafting Thomas Robinson and Ben McElmore, three-peating on draft bus. In total, Boogie's first three years alone left this Sacramento team passing up on Kawhi Leonard, Clay Thompson, Damian Lillard, CJ McCollum, and Giannis Antetokounmpo. Any combination of these guys with DeMarcus Cousins would have proven to be a top young core in the league, but Boogie was essentially left out to dry by this team. With a quick pickup of Raptors winger Rudy Gay and the addition of coach Mike Malone, things actually started to look up. Mike and Boogie had a clear mutual respect. Malone recognized the talent here, making him the focal point of the offense, with a near league leading 32.7% usage rate. This was where he jumped to all-star levels at near 23 and 12 averages. The addition of Mike Malone should not be understated at this point, and it was pretty interesting how good these guys hit it off. Malone labels himself as an emotional and hyper-competitive guy. I guess there was room for the both of them in this case. Malone held him accountable, even calling him a big puppy for not wanting to run and kicking him out of practice. Bogey made noticeable strides in his demeanor. He respected him for sure, and it showed on the floor as well, as Boogie emerged into a top big in the league. Malone had a vision for him and executed it well. They finished 28-54, and 54, identical to the prior year, but this isn't to say that they weren't improved, as they definitely were. With an offense-centric on high post entries to Boogie and pick and rolls with Isaiah Thomas, as well as an improved defensive game jumping from 29th in the league to 20th, they allowed Rudy Gay to show off in transition as well. The progression was very clear, the Kings were trending in the right direction. They came out winning 9 of their first 15 games in the next year, and this was uncharted territory for him. Kings fans were loving it, but unfortunately Boogie was sidelined for 10 games after the hot start with viral meningitis. This was a tough loss that would sideline him for a couple weeks, and they fell 7 of 9 games in his absence. Without the consent of any players, or much of a warning even, Kings decided that they needed to make a change that would alter the progress of the roster for good, after firing Mike Malone. This was bad. They blew up their progress entirely. They even traded Isaiah Thomas for a bag of rocks. Boogie was having the best season of his career up to this point, finishing with 24 and 12 averages and an all-star nod, but he lost his patience after this. I mean, it was the only coach that he respected, and they traded all the pieces away and continued to draft draft bust after draft bust. I mean, they took Nick Stauskas in 2014, Willie Cauley Stein in 2015, Marquise Chris in 2016. You could say they busted every pick since DeMarcus, and I'd agree, they're probably the worst drafting team I've ever seen. The dysfunction continues as the Kings hired Tyrone Corbin as a replacement for Malone. 
and no disrespect to him, he was just not ready to take on this situation. He was fired after just 28 games and George Carl was brought in as the long-term option. And let's just say this did not go well. DeMarcus wasn't happy with George. It's likely that he was upset that he wasn't Malone and lashed out in just general disappointment with the management. But after finding out that Coach Carl attempted to trade him following the season, things became personal. DeMarcus tweeted out the infamous snakes in the grass tweet, likely targeting Carl. And DeMarcus turned back on his own ways, regressing as more of the drama and locker room harm, according to numerous accounts. The drama was off-putting, I mean, to this day it's hard to find these guys saying much of anything nice about each other. But one thing's for sure is the Kings needed Boogie. 2016, he developed into the undeniable best player at his position, totaling 27 and 11. This was the start of his absolute prime. I mean, this was an interesting player profile. First things first, he was still Boogie, scoring inside with his soft touch, unreal strength, and fantastic face-up skills. His defense had also developed to a serviceable level, just about league average I'd say. Where this year got interesting was when he started knocking down the three ball, going from basically shooting none to three a game at a 33% clip. This was kind of wild with him being one of the first centers really ever to expand out this far. He was clearly an offensive juggernaut, but what I think was the most underrated and undervalued part of his game at this time was his playmaking ability. At 3.3 assists a game and jumping over 4.5 the following year, this is elite ass territory. I mean, he was a top 3 passing big in the league at this time. This is a crucial skill for post-up heavy guys, and was one of the reasons that he found so much success in the Mike Malone offense. 2016 was a great year on paper for Boogie, but everyone was getting fed up with this Kings team. I mean, Boogie was either just getting in a fit of rage and either not playing at all, not running back in transition, or just going off in the paint for 120 points. 33 and 49 with the best center in the league is pretty bad. They chose Boogie over George Carl the next year, kind of surprised they even put up with Carl for this long, but something had to change here. Don't get me wrong, George Carl isn't the worst coach in the world, but this was just such a shit show in the locker room that shouldn't have been prolonged and shouldn't have probably happened in the first place. The Sacramento Kings saga finally came to an end with the following season, as Boogie was the center point of a blockbuster trade, pairing him with the best power forward in the league in Anthony Davis, reviving the concept of the Twin Towers. The Pelicans were in a pretty shit scenario, leaving Davis in a similar situation to Cousins, but fleece the Kings with a package centered around Buddy Heald, who, although he figured out it a bit after this time, was very unproven and never touched Cousins' level of production. The Sacramento era was a big fuck up, I mean, draft bust after draft bust, horrible lineups with weird mixes of vets and just shitty players, and of course the Michael Malone firing, which gets worse day by day. I think we get a glimpse of what could have been with Malone's success in Denver, an offense centered around a big guy who's serviceable defensively, elite passing the ball, shooting the ball, and handling the ball at his position, and great in the post and around the basket. DeMarcus had the skill set that the position was gravitating towards, and Malone could unlock that. Boogie finished the season with a slight dip in production, but to be expected, of course, sharing the ball with AD. This team was scary, I mean, very scary. Drew Holiday, Anthony Davis, and Boogie is an extraordinarily talented big three that have the potential to complement each other beautifully. Davis developing his floor spacing and Boogie being elite in shooting and facilitating already allowed them to pretty much bully whichever matchup was more favorable. Drew could defend any guard in the NBA, stretch the floor out, and make the right play. This wasn't the era of the Twin Towers by any means, but this was the best front court pairing since Duncan and Robinson. The next season we got to see what these boys could do, and at times it looked like the scariest starting lineup in the NBA, even with the KD Warriors. But at other times it wasn't so pretty. There was growing pains as having two bigs that like to operate in the paint that are used to being number one options. The potential was there on paper, it's obvious, but it didn't always work out that way. It was expected that there would be some type of struggle, I mean the big three heats struggled at first, with DeMarcus and AD totaling 25 a game with 5.4 assists and 13 rebounds, it's hard to imagine them struggling for very long. This team was very fun, but just over halfway through the season, Pelicans fans' lives flashed before their eyes as DeMarcus Cousins went down with the torn ACL. This is the most unfortunate thing that can happen to a career in this sport. I mean, we all know how devastating these are. One or two or maybe three guys have recovered to their prior production level after this. I mean, this meant Boogie was never going to be the same. And this sucks to see. Being just 27 years old, this team was going to see what the best two bigs in the world could do together. They shook up the whole NBA. I mean, Anthony Davis wore Boogie's jersey in the All-Star game. It was scary. 
and not many teams were willing to take a risk on this guy after this. He fell around to a mid-level exception guy. The plan, I'm sure, was to take a one-year deal after his contract expired for cheap, show what you can do on a winning team, and then sign for more in the future. He became the most hated player in the NBA for a while, in a move that sparked a ton of controversy signing with the Golden State Warriors for just $5 million. He didn't suit up until mid-January, just under a year after the injury, and he actually started for them putting up some pretty good numbers. 16 points and 8 rebounds a game in just 25 minutes is very good production. He was a pretty piss poor defender, falling from 3.2 to 1.5 defensive win shares. With offensive production like that, I mean he's a 22 and 12 guy per 36 minutes sharing the ball with some of the best scorers in the world. There was life for this guy and he signed a one year deal with the Lakers after this season, in which he reunited with AD which was pretty cool and had the possibility to rekindle a big three, this time with LeBron fucking James instead of Drew Holiday. But life is cruel sometimes, this didn't exactly work out. In fact, it couldn't have gone worse. Boogie tore his ACL again in an offseason pickup game, basically ensuring that we would never see this guy really play at a high level ever again. Things went from horrible to nightmares for Boogie. Just a couple months later, a phone call leaked threatening to kill his ex-girlfriend after not allowing him to have his son at his wedding. He was charged with domestic violence and harassment before the charges were eventually dropped. I'm not here to tell you what to think about the incident, but I will say what NBA GMs and executives think. This kind of drama is a bad look to a franchise, no matter what his intentions may have been and what kind of guy he really is. After missing the entirety of the 2020 season, this was the beginning of the full-on boogie journeyman career. He landed short stints with the Rockets and Clippers in 2021 before being waived, and deals with the Bucks and Nuggets in 2022 before failing to land a contract for this current season. DeMarcus is out of the NBA, although from a glance it certainly looks like the two ACLs pretty much murdered a career on path for the Hall of Fame. This is only partly true, I'd say. DeMarcus Cousins per 36 numbers show that he's still far above average, at least offensively. As a very smart player who can still impact a game in numerous ways, there's a little more to this than meets the eye, and Bob Myers shared on the All The Smoke podcast that guys are just scared of how he's going to act. To fix your reputation, you can't just act up to par, you gotta blow guys out of the water. It's not fair, it's not ideal, but it's the truth. And this sucks, as DeMarcus Cousins has, was, and likely always will be one of the most misunderstood players the game has ever seen. No, he should not have thrown a ball at Chris Paul, and maybe he should have kept his feelings about the Kings organization to himself, but the media likes to look at the intensity of other greats with high praise and gratitude, while labeling DeMarcus's competitiveness as mental weakness. The media loves to show you the low lights of his personal character without a peep about his community assistance wards and countless acts of kindness that fly under the radar. At this point it looks like he's an NBA talent that's gotten blackballed from the league indefinitely. Maybe someday we'll see him on the floor again and hell maybe he'll even be a starting level talent. But until that happens, this is the Boogie Cousins story. Thank you for watching and peace out.